final segment of our course covers the reassembly of the motor and the procedures to test run it. First, double check all parts to be sure that all repairs or replacements have been completed. Another inspection will also serve to uncover any oversights you could have made during your initial inspection. Once you're satisfied with your work, you're ready to reassemble the motor. Next, the workman slides the inboard bearing cartridge over the shaft and positions it against the rotor like this. You're now ready to install the bearing on the shaft. As we mentioned during the disassembly of the motor, the ball bearings have an interference fit with the shaft journal. Therefore, the workman slides the bearing onto the shaft as far as it will go. He then places a sleeve over the shaft and positions it against the inner race of the bearing. It's then a simple matter to tap the bearing onto the shaft until it is firmly seated against the shoulder. As you know, the same thing may be accomplished by heating the bearing and shrinking it onto the shaft fit. Follow the procedure preferred at your plant. With the bearing in place, the workman slides the bearing cartridge over it until the bearing is seated correctly. Next, slide the bearing retainer down the shaft until it seats against the bearing cartridge, as shown. Then install the screws in the retainer and tighten them securely. The procedure must now be repeated for the outboard end to the rotor shaft. First, slide the bearing cartridge back against the rotor. Then install the outboard bearing against the shoulder on the shaft. As we mentioned earlier, the method of installation is up to you. Slide the bearing cartridge into position on the bearing. And then slide the bearing retainer into place, tightening the screws, securing the retainer to the cartridge. Now refer to the manufacturer's manual for the motor and determine what type of lubricant is required. Our motor is lubricated with grease. Therefore, the workman greases both the inboard and outboard bearings, as shown here. You are now ready to slide the rotor assembly into the stator. This is a very ticklish job, since you have to be extremely careful not to damage the windings of the stator in the process. This method is wrong. Don't ever attempt to force the rotor into the stator, or slide it in, as shown here. If you do, you will almost certainly damage the windings in the stator. Here is a method which has proven both effective and acceptable at most plants. The weight of the rotor is supported by a hoist through the yellow slings, as you can see. However, the workman has placed a pipe over one end of the shaft and is using the pipe as a lever to guide the rotor carefully into position in the stator. With the rotor in place, the next step is to install the end bell on the inboard end of the motor housing, as shown. Tighten the cap screws securely, using the crossover method to prevent tilting of the end bell on the housing. Now the inboard end plate is replaced. This end plate holds the bearing cartridge in position by securing it to the end bell. First, you must install the cap screws in the inner circle. These cap screws fasten the bearing cartridge to the end plate. Then install the cap screws in the outer circle on the end plate. This fastens the end plate to the end bell and positions the bearing cartridge. You should now repeat the procedure for the opposite or outboard end of the motor. Replace the outboard end bell first. Tighten the cap screws, securing it to the motor housing. Then replace the end plate as you did in the inboard end. Replace the inner circle of cap screws first, and then the outer circle. Make sure they are all tightened securely. The motor is now ready for the first test run. We suggest that you check with your instructor or supervisor with regard to the test running 
since your plant may allow only certain authorized personnel to complete these tests. The first step is to connect the test leads to the proper leads in the junction box. Don't forget to connect a ground wire to the motor frame, as you can see at the bottom center of the screen. The other end of the leads should then be connected to the test panel, as shown here. Note that the ground wire is attached on the left side of the panel. The next step will be to start and test run the motor. Bring it up to operating speed and temperature, or as close as possible, since there is no load on the motor we're using. This means you will need to run the motor for several minutes, allowing it to warm up. While the motor is running, the workman uses a vibration analyzer to check for excessive vibration in both of the bearings. It's also a good idea to listen for excessive noise coming from the motor, which could be an indication of a problem. After your vibration check, use a pyrometer to locate possible overheating in either of the bearing housings. As you can see, the workman is taking his reading from the bearing retainer. With both the vibration and temperature checks complete, cut the power to the motor and disconnect the leads at the junction box. The ground wire may be left in place. The next step in the reassembly is to replace the fan on the outboard end of the shaft and tighten it securely in place. After the fan is installed on the shaft, replace the fan housing on the motor housing. Replace the long through bolts as shown and tighten them securely. We are now ready to test run the motor again to check for possible vibration caused by the reassembly of the fan. Occasionally the fan will be out of balance after installation, causing vibration outside the acceptable range. The leads are reconnected at the junction box and the motor is restarted for a second test run. A second vibration check is then made on the motor if excessive vibration has developed since the last check, we'll know that the fan is out of balance and that it must be corrected. After completing the check, disconnect the leads from the motor and replace the cover on the junction box as shown. The final step will be to install the coupling half on the shaft. Your electric motor is now completely reassembled and tested. Before returning the motor to service, make sure that all paperwork required at your plant has been completed satisfactorily. Then clean up your tools and equipment and put them away. As you have now seen for yourself, the mechanical features of electric motors, such as our example, are not overly complicated or difficult. Remember though that there are hundreds of different types of motors each with slight variations in their construction. The motor we have shown you is a very basic type, which was intended to familiarize you with the disassembly, repair, and reassembly procedures which are considered most common. This course was not intended to create experts. That can come only with months and even years of experience on the job. We have some questions for you now in exercise number four in your workbook.